If you find writing marketing and sales copy about as much fun as going to the dentist, then listen up as award-winning copywriter Joanna Weeb shows you how to write copy that converts. And it's not painful at all. In fact, it's rather fun, just like marketing should be. Before we get stuck into episode 419 of the award-winning small business big marketing show, the marketing gold is made exclusively possible thanks to American Express. And I say exclusively because for this and the next five weeks, Amex has again kindly taken all available advertising spots. Love that. Their suite of business cards really do meet the financial needs of small business owners just like you. Plus, Amex help in getting your business expenses to reward you, just like past guest Chris Gray does. He flies somewhere exotic about 15 times a year at the pointy end of the plane for free, excluding the odd airline tax, of course. Simply Google Amex business to find out more <laughs> and then try and wipe the smile off your face. I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls, to take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. I'm your host, Tim Bo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, are a motivated business owner, ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Big show today. In fact, a really practical show today. Gun copywriter Joanna Weeb shares some brilliant hacks to get you writing marketing copy that'll turn your prospects into buyers. Ka-ching! And another motivated listener shares a marketing strategy that's working for them. And in return, I give them a prize or three. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Do you need a speaker for your next conference? Recommend Timbo to your event organiser. Or better still, book him. Tim Reed. that's R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U couple of updates before we go and meet gun copywriter Joe Anna Weeb. Had some fantastic feedback on the recent episode I did with Buddhist monk or ex-Buddhist monk Clark Scott, who has turned entrepreneur. It was a chat, an episode all about introducing more compassion into your business. And I received, just to give you a sense of the kind of feedback I'm getting, I'm getting I won't reveal who wrote me this, uh, I'll, it'll remain anonymous, but this person says, hey Timbo, I just wanted to give you a bit of feedback on one of your latest episodes with Clark Scott, the ex-Buddhist monk. This is an episode I nearly skipped. I thought a lot of people might do that. As you might, as you put it, it was a bit woo-woo sounding, but boy, am I glad I didn't miss this one. There's a few things going on in my life right now, plus we've had a bit of nastiness from a local competitor, and it was weighing us down. In fact, weighing me down, he says. Driving home tonight, I put on your podcast and hit the point where Clark was talking about just letting it go and being compassionate to yourself. In a job where compassion fatigue is rife, it's a lesson I needed to hear. I sat in the car for a long time listening to the end of the podcast and let it all sink in. I've never done that with a podcast before. Anyway, I just wanted to say thanks as that podcast really helped me personally when I needed it and I'm sure will help my business moving forward. Brilliant. Thank you, listener, for sharing that. You know, at the end of the day, what business owner doesn't go through tough times, right? And I guess it's how we manage ourselves during those tough times that counts because Uh, If we're not operating uh, at some level of great capacity, then how can those around us do it as well? As as business owners, as managers, uh, I guess it's one of the pressures that we have to live with. So I'm glad that episode could bring a bit of joy uh, and a bit of reassurance to that listener. And I know it brought the same to many more. Thanks for your feedback on that, everyone. Just come back from... 
Uh, a few days up on the Gold Coast, I emceed the three-day conference, Retail Global Conference, the biggest e-commerce conference uh, in Australia. And I just want to say thank you to so many. There were a 1,000 people there. So many of you are coming up and saying hello. You listen to my show. You love what I'm doing. It's helping your business. Really, really appreciate that. Little story. Uh, started wearing contact lenses two days before the start of the conference, which was a bit touch and go, but I really needed them, uh, particularly when I'm on stage having, refer- having to refer to notes and glasses. My glasses just weren't cutting it. Couldn't get one of my contact lenses out on the second day after the conference. Don't know if that's ever happened to you, but I went in to absolute panic mode. Had a good go at getting them out, digging at my right eye and literally digging until it got really sore and red. Let it go for an hour, came back to it for an hour, let it go for an hour, came back and I just could not get it. I didn't know whether it was in there, whether it was out. My eye was killing me. Didn't know whether it was because the contact lens was there or because I was just kind of prodding and poking. Had to go to sleep with it overnight, wasn't comfortable, woke up, wasn't pretty, uh, and then uh, did the, believe it or not, did the first session of the conference and then during the break had to race off to the very good folk at OPSM in Pacific Fair on the Gold Coast and took two optometrists to get it out. The first one couldn't, second one did. Boy, oh boy, was it a relief getting it out. And a big thank you to those people who helped me at OPSM. Uh, boy, oh boy, scary stuff. Don't know whether I'll be putting contact lenses back in. I think I will, but, yeah, not looking forward to the next time I do it. Anyway, bit of an update. Let's get on with the show. You know, I'm working on bringing you some chats with some amazing business owners uh, over the coming weeks. Carmen Musley's founder, Carolyn Creswell, whose mission is to create Australia's best workplace, will hopefully join us, just working on sealing that deal. Jen Geel from Mountain Bikes Direct, who with a husband and another married couple have created an eight-figure business selling mountain bikes 100% online. She gave a great talk at the conference last week and uh, she's agreed to come on the show. And a fellow from New York who's created the world's largest online marketplace for, wait for it, cannabis-related products and services, which are illegal in Australia at the moment, but an incredible growth industry. But right now, Let's meet Joanna Weeb from Canadian copywriting agency Copy Hackers, who believes having a great copywriter on your virtual marketing team is one of the best kept secrets in the marketing and sales world. You know what? I'm personally shocked at just how few small business owners realize this. It is an absolute game changer if you've got a great copywriting person on on your virtual team. However, I get the fact that it's expensive and not everyone can do that. It it seems standard practice, you know, to have immediate access to a graphic designer. But when it comes to writing copy, most business owners actually try to do it themselves or pass it on to someone who has the least amount of work to do. Does that sound familiar? Like, as I say, I I get that every business can't afford a great copywriter uh, because they don't come cheap. Great copywriters are worth their weight in gold, but they don't come cheap. So that's why I'm excited to bring you this chat with Joanna, where we cover what makes great copy, how to write copy that converts, uh, why we should be studying how our customers speak, and she finishes with four quick and dirty copywriting tips to get you going on your copywriting journey like now. If ever... If ever there was an episode where you needed a pen and paper at the ready, this is it. I started off by asking Joanna why she thinks people like her are the marketing world's best kept secret. Uh, It's just entirely based on my bias. No, I'm just (laughs) kidding. (laughs) It keeps me employed. Um, No, I say it because I just keep seeing it in results. So we do we do a lot of testing at Copy Hackers. Um, and I've done a lot in my life before Copy Hackers, my business. Um, so we just keep seeing it. You know, you run a lot of A B tests online. Um, and more often than not, the ones that we see winning, not even more often than not, like with a really high win rate, um, are those really basic headline tests, button copy changes, and really simple, straightforward copy tests. So I can't help but believe that copy's got an awful lot to do with converting people. Yeah, interesting. I often say, and I think, you know, even personalizing this, you know, when you see, when you're reading copy uh, as a consumer, just as a, you know, you know, general bloke, general girl, and think, you know, you're reading it and you're actually engaged in it, 
and mm. it's not hard, it's enjoyable, and you know that's smart copy that kind of starts you off broadly and takes you on a journey to possibly inquiry, even a sale. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's definitely the objective, I would say, for most copy is to, yeah, get them to ideally to a sale, depending where they are, of course, but Mm. to some point of conversion. So they don't just, you know, have this dead end experience with you where they read what you wrote and then walk away and don't do anything. Mm. Um, Yeah, that copy should be getting them to do something. And ideally, yes, getting them to that amazing, wonderful money in your pocket sale. (laughs) I had, um, (laughs) it's funny, you know, I had Mike Rhodes on recently, who's a Google AdWords specialist Mm. in Australia. And he, he, he was quoted as saying, Google AdWords is the closest thing to an advertising money tree. And uh, I thought, yeah, I kind of get that. You know, if you get your AdWords right, spend a dollar and get two back. But I'm guessing you feel the same about copy. I do. I do. Of course, it's not quite as easy to measure direct results as it is with PPC Mm. (laughs) when you're doing an AdWords campaign. I guess you can say, okay, we did spend a dollar here and we absolutely made this many dollars here. Um, But with copywriting, it's... uh, I mean, it's part of all of your communication, right? At all points when you're sending out, you know, a thank you email to a new client or someone who just bought whatever it is you're selling online, you do a quick follow up. Mm -hmm. Um, That's copy. Everything along the way at every point, there's copy and it's so hard so often to measure the success. There are other times when it's quite easy to, but but for every word we, we write, we don't see a dollar associated with that word, which is different from, yeah, the money tree that is PPC. But mm. yeah, I absolutely see it as being critically attached to making those sales. Now, there's so much we could talk about, but let's, let's just pull back a bit. I, I want to get to the point where you share with us some some sort of high converting copywriting tips, some little nuggets that, you know, listeners can walk away with. But let's start at sort of a macro view, Joe, and sort of say, okay, does one copy fit all? Because I know you, you spend a lot of time in the online world, but you know, like there's web copy, there's sales letter copy, there's email copy, there's brochure copy, there's even the Christmas card copy. So like mm-hmm. if, if 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 a small business owner says, okay, I am going to put a writer on my team, mm. um, should that writer be expected to be good at all those uh, outputs? You know, yeah, I think that's a really great, question the idea of bringing a writer on staff and what that person should be able to do. I mean, a writer is a bit of a luxury for a lot of businesses, which is kind of tragic in my opinion. So shouldn't be so naughty. I mean, it's it's, it's absolutely the case for most businesses. You know, Mm -hmm. I did this yesterday at a a talk I gave, Uh, put your hand up if you could uh, go and get a brochure designed and, you know, uh, right now with with your graphic designer, most hands went up. Keep your hand Mm -hmm. up if you could have that brochure written by your copywriter, most hands went down. Mm, Nobody has one. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people don't know what copy is or what a copywriter does. So if you don't really know to isolate that as a thing, how could you possibly know that there's a specialist in that area who can make that better for you? Mm. If it just felt like words, right? Oh, I'm just writing. Yeah. No, 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 but you're writing copy, right? And it's a different, it's an entirely different way of writing. So yeah, to your point about can one person do all these things or should you expect one person to? I mean, that's kind of why I recommend that small businesses in particular, um, don't try necessarily to outsource their writing or to bring somebody in to do all their writing. Um, because for small businesses, it is, it's always going to be, I can harp about all I want and say, go invest in a writer. And they, there's other things that are always more pressing because they physically can't work Photoshop, but they Mm. physically can work word, right? So there's a limitation there that keeps people from being in a place where they can hire a writer. So, okay, fine. If you can't hire one, learn how to do it yourself. Don't, you don't have to like go to some crazy huge course and become a copywriter, but learn how to do it. And a lot of it is just paying attention to what you're seeing out there and, and reading, you know, blog posts and little things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and and then you'll like you know eventually start to identify differences between brochure copywriting and Christmas card copywriting and similarities between those things too. And what should 
kind of be the same across all of your media and all the different, you know, materials that you have for your business. But I do believe that a, a small business owner um, and a, a growth hacker can write their own copy probably better than if they brought some junior copywriter in like fresh out of college or something like that. No offense to junior copywriters, but <laughs> hello to all you junior writers out there. So uh, look, I, I get that. Um, uh, it's interesting hearing you say that um, because I get the fact that, yeah, it's hard to learn Photoshop. So bring in the designer. We all have a pen, we all have a keyboard. Um, so get writing. However, wow. And, and I also agree that most small business owners will be the best at writing their own copy because it's coming right. from their heart, their personality, their tone of voice. I get that. However, what mm. a time suck. I know. <laughs> hey, uh, it is a time investment. <laughs> oh, well, it is. It's absolutely. It's, yeah, I know. I know. But I'm just going, you know, and right now, here's the thing. What I know for all my listeners is the reason they're not cranking out great marketing, and many are because they listen to this show, is that they have these limiting beliefs around lack of time, lack of money, lack of knowledge, right? So they're all, yeah. it's kind of, they're all spitting out working in their business. And now you're telling them to write their own copy. So, um, I, I, do, I do get that, but it is a it's hard one to get your head around. Well, you're welcome to outsource it if you want to, but then I would say be prepared to invest in it. If you actually think that, if you actually want to sell something, then you have to, for me at least, if you want to sell something, it's critical that you identify copy as a key part of making that sale happen. Mm -hmm. it, it is. So, okay. So if you say, well, we want to make of this campaign, we're running a promotion in our store or through our emails or whatever it is that we're doing as a small business, we're going to run this promotion. We want to make $10,000 off this promotion, um, 10,000 in profit, then be ready to invest though a decent amount to, to, to get there. And I would say invest in, in a copywriter, but copywriters don't come cheap. So mm. I wish that, you know, I know it takes a lot of time to write it yourself. And I know learning to do it yourself takes even more time, right? And there's all this upskilling that has to happen, which is super time consuming. Mm. But on the flip side, if you want to get great copy, I mean, great copywriters are, are frankly, just keeping it real, extremely expensive. Wow. Um, it really, it really... <laughs> It really adds up. So I can't help but think, okay, small business owner, <laughs> there are a lot of things you can delegate. You can delegate all day long, all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and some things don't require a certain skill level. But when for me, for me, and again, you're right, as you said at the beginning, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm biased, <laughs> but I've seen it. It There's a certain skill that... Ugh, if you're going to pay someone to do your copy, they better do it really well. Yeah, you've got me. I, I, I know exactly where you're coming from now. So what you're saying is identify all those other things. And I talk a lot about the virtual marketing team. As a small business these days, we can surround ourselves with marketing specialists in all sorts of categories. So outsource your AdWords, outsource your SEO, outsource your design, but f and, and, and in, in, with the aim of freeing yourself up to write. Ideally, right? At least to write maybe until, <sighs> yeah, for one, yes, I agree with you absolutely yeah, yeah. there. And I, and I love how you're putting yourself out of a job. No, <laughs> I, I don't know. I get it. I don't even, I, I hear it. Yeah. But there's always, I think, going to be work for copywriters out yeah. there, hopefully. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess the only part that makes me hesitate, and it's something that I tend to not give enough thought to is that there are people out there who just desperately hate writing. Yep. There are others who think, you know, who have a novel in their desk that they're working on, nobody knows about. They actually secretly love writing. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, journalers and things like that. But but there is a large group of people out there or a large percentage of small business owners um, who who don't want to sit in front of the page and put something down on it. And if it's going to take that much then you know if it's if it's going to be this major hassle for you then yeah then then put some some money aside and invest in outsourcing yeah. that to someone who's skilled not in content creation but in copywriting there's a distinction between those two between someone who might write a blog post for you and someone who will write your homepage for you hold that thought because i want to talk i want to investigate that a little bit more um one thought i had just to finish this conversation about who should write the copy and how do you go about getting it done is that uh, a mate of mine only last week has been kind of going through this process of should i get a writer should i write my own copy 
what he's ended up doing is writing the first draft and mm. then going, okay, now it's time to get a professional to do the uh, to cast a professional eye over it. And um, not only is this fellow um, incredibly poor at grammar and spelling, so <laughs> like he needs an editor and a writer. But uh, so I thought that that's kind of interesting in itself, you know. Do get yeah. get the first draft down. That'll be coming from your heart as the business owner, your tone of voice, and then get someone to um to clean it up. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, the best writing usually happen happens in that editing phase. If you can get your thoughts down on the page and hopefully have those thoughts informed by what you know about what you're offering and what you know about what your customers want from mm-hmm. you or what they most desire, if you can get that stuff down first, then yeah, the magic tends to happen in the editing phase when you go in and apply, you know, little tricks and clean up techniques and things like that to make your copy perform better anyway. Love it. So, so Joe, let's talk then about just going back to that concept of different types of copy. You mentioned, you know, there's content creation, there's mm. copywriting, you know, sort of within that there's website, copy, sales letters, emails, back to the Christmas cards. Um, mm-hmm. Again, is that... Well, now, now the business owner is writing it all, but what, what, tell me the differences <laughs> between these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think there are some of those things that the business owner doesn't have to write. It's really the sales copy that I, I, I keep close to the chest, right? The other stuff, um, when you're talking about like creating a blog post, there are people who, um, who can do that for you very easily. If you want to write, you know, the six ways to, um, I don't know, I've, I have all these, like, I have pet grooming going on in my head, but so I almost said the six ways to like, neuter a dog but that's awful go for it hey there will be a pet groomer listening joe so don't don't oh. be shy okay hey? six well, ways okay. to groom a dalmatian exactly without, without losing the spots <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point and that without is an important part of copywriting because that's interesting um but yeah i would i would say though that sort of thing can be easily researched and there are basic principles to follow when you're writing a blog post so you could kind of outsource that without feeling too weird about it, right? Like someone can go write, can go research that for you and write an appropriate blog post. And then, you know, if it's not catchy enough, you can do little things in that to clean it up. Mm-hmm. But that's the kind of thing I would outsource. That's those, those content marketing pieces um, where you're producing free content to generate interest, to bring traffic to your site, to get people to share. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of stuff I feel is... Oftentimes, unless unless your content marketing is your business, um, then a lot of the times that can be outsourced. Mm-hmm. And and then more creative things like you know producing a tagline or like the actual tagline that goes below your logo if you choose to have that, or doing the Christmas card as you say. Um, those kinds of peripheral elements, um, I would feel also okay about outsourcing. Like a, a copywriter like myself, I wouldn't work on anybody's tagline. It's it, it it doesn't that's that's really i've found i've been an agency writer i've been an in-house writer at big companies and little ones too um and an agency can handle that kind of stuff an agency can make you can come up with taglines all day long for you and there'll be some really amazing creative ones in there and one of them's bound to work and same z's for the you know creative on the christmas card right? Same thing. They can do that for you. So I would say you can also outsource that, Mm -hmm. but it's the sales stuff, the stuff where your people are on your website. You've only got so much time with them. Um, You need to get the right people who think about the ecosystem, right? Everything that's going on with optimizing a website or a web experience, including email and the user experience and Mm -hmm. the ads that drove them there or the pages, whatever they were that drove them there. This, again, this larger picture of like a, a larger ecosystem, getting people thinking about that, that's the kind of copywriting that to me, um, feels like if you're not going to do it yourself, don't outsource that to a content marketer or a, a person who writes blog posts because they're completely different things. Does that make sense? Or is the distinction obvious or no? Yeah, yeah, it is, and and, and it's where the money is. I mean, you, this, yes. when you start talking sales letters, uh, website homepages, landing pages, whatever it is, you know, calls to action to get people. You know, if you've got a website where the first thing you want people to do is is sign up for something, so that you can develop a list and have an ongoing conversation with them, then I can see massive value in having a writer uh, or use the word manipulate uh, that copy so that. 
they do sign up. And when they sign up, that series of that emails that are going to come through your autoresponder um, mm-hmm. is just as important. So, um, yeah, I can see that being being yeah. really important. And if you were to outsource anything and, and were to pay the big bucks for a writer, and they are big bucks, um, mm-hmm. um, then that, that would be where it's at. Agreed. And I just further to that, if they're not big bucks, honestly, any copywriter who's got results in the past knows their value and is highly likely to charge you accordingly. So I personally, this might sound like stupid. Um, Not that anything stupid, it might sound silly. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but if they're not charging like a premium, that'd be a flag for me. I I wouldn't hire a copywriter to work on my sales copy who didn't charge a premium because I mean, if they're any good, they'll know they're good. Well, I, I, I think what you've got no? to do in hiring – no, yeah, I agree. I just think in hiring that writer for that such important job, you are going to want to see uh, – you'd want to speak to a client of theirs for whom they generated um, a decent sale for. Yes, at least one, right? You don't, otherwise, <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't be pre- paying a premium for someone who's only had you know, one or two clients because th- they need more experience yeah. under their belt. Yeah. Isn't it John Carlton or Dan Kennedy? Which one? Who, who charges some exorbitant amount to even start a project because they just know that they're going to turn on the money tap? Oh, I, I know who doesn't. I mean, definitely. You said Dan Kennedy. I don't even. I, can you even hire him? <laughs> Is it like, possible? Yeah. yeah, you have to fly him in on a private jet that's set at a perfect temperature, and he has to be fanned <laughs> with giant feathers the whole time. Uh, I heard you're not dissimilar, so uh, you know. <laughs> It takes one to know one. Yeah, right. Now, listeners, I am talking to Joanne Weeb from Copy Hackers. I'll give you her tagline on a website where startups learn to convert like mofos. How rude. Now, uh, <laughs> in fact, a previous guest, great. I love, I love the word mofo. A previous guest was Andre from Vino Mofo, which is an online oh. wine retailer in Australia. So um, Nice. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yes. Mofo is an underused word in marketing. I think you're right. And, you know, (laughs) it's a great example. Like let's talk personality because one of the great things about good copy is having that that tone of voice, that personality that represents your brand. And, um, you know, it was interesting using Andre as the example with with Vino Mofo. um, It's a great example of injecting personality into the brand because Andre was sick and tired of the the wine industry talking about black currant overturns and, you know, (laughs) caffeine (laughs) underbelly and, you know, all this kind of wacky wine talk. And yeah. um, so he's just created this online wine retailer, Vino Mofo, where they just talk in normal terms, you know, about oh. how that wine tastes. I love it. I love that there is that if you're willing to go there and if you think about it, there's so much like potential liberation in starting your own business and truly doing it how you want to do it with like like something that's legit, that's like true to who you are, right? If you would call it, a mofo like just say it yep. and then you know it's refreshing for not only for your audience but for you so you don't have to fake who you no, are the no. whole time so there, therefore the writing becomes easier I, I would encourage and uh surely a major part of a brief to either a, a writer or to yourself when you're writing is just be crystal clear on the personality of your brand what are those three four maybe five personality traits that you know that represent you that are you and not your competitors Totally. What a great way to distinguish yourself with personality, given that emotion is how we make buying decisions. And then, you know, of course, later support that with logic or validate it with something logical. Mm. But in the beginning, the way we connect is on emotion and how much better, like we connect as human beings with one another based on our personalities and, and likenesses. So it feels like there's this this obvious emotional pull just in the way that you communicate. Um, And there are probably a lot of people out there who want you to communicate naturally uh, the way you are because they'd like to hang out with you Mm. as a human being too. So showing that self is really good. And sometimes it takes work though, right? Like we've been trained to really think a lot before we put anything down on the page or to edit ourselves before we even write or that, uh, the way we said that was wrong, and here's the white, right way to say it. Mm. But when you're writing your own stuff, you can actually like do it your own way. And if you have to, you know, have a drink, have a glass of wine as you're writing your copy to like chill out and loosen up a bit about it. I, whatever works, right, to get you to have that personality come through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's your secret sauce: alcohol. 
it's Bloody always- Canadians. <laughs> Love it. You should talk. Yeah, yeah, true, true. You know us too well. You know, I, I, again, this uh, at this event I was talking at yesterday, um, there was a fellow in the audience who's uh, – who is selling into academia, you know, into universities and, and and educated people. And he was really struggling in some of the content he was having to write because he felt as though he had to pitch it uh, at this this client base that he put on a pedestal because they were professors, professors and associate professors and all these learned people. And he, he was finding it really hard and in the end just resisting it. And we had this kind of discussion which led down the exact path we're talking about, like be yourself. You know, first and foremost, my view is um, people are people first before they're business owners or professors or anything else, you know, and people buy from people. And so I, I think it's really important to understand what your brand's about and be true to that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you could be really... Um, a game changer too, if you were to talk more naturally to professors. I mean, they're not all stodgy men up on a hill with white beards, right? Like, aren't they? Elbow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe where you are, right? <laughs> Actually, right. maybe where I am too. Yeah, okay. I mean, there were a lot like that, but then there were some really cool ones too, right? Who oh. were like always, you know, not that I'm supporting drugs, but they were like <laughs> always clearly on something. And um, so there's a range of human beings in there. There's a range of of people. And by the way, yeah. like the best selling books are the most fantastic, imaginative ones, right? That have people all over the world. That old scholars and yeah. accountants and lawyers and all of these and engineers, people who are supposed to be you know emotionless, and you're supposed to talk to them in this very formal or jargony way. They're all buying these books and going to movies. They're humans. They yeah, want to yeah. be entertained Correct. and they want to engage and feel connected. So it's, it's I don't know, it seems like a really old idea to believe you have to talk to a certain profession in a certain way. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now, Joe, w- w- let's get into, uh, let's roll the sleeves up and get under the hood and, and give our listeners some kind of how-tos because, what you know, I, I think your advice earlier about, hey, look, you don't have to outsource, but if you're not going to outsource and write your own copy, then learn some stuff. Get, you know, bone up on some, some copy basics and spend time uh, understanding what makes great copy. Now, um, whilst you come up with some just unbelievable wis- wisdom, <laughs> I'm going to open the batting, which is a cricket term, which you don't even know what that is. No. So, but it's it's no, a I kind don't. of a sporting analogy um, by saying that surely, as you sit down to write, you are going to have to have someone in mind. Yeah, and that's someone yeah. I call them your best mates. That person who has the highest propensity to want to buy from you. But um, tell me, I, I, I'm assuming you agree with me. If you don't say so, but if you do, then how do you identify that person? How do you frame that person in your mind? Yeah, I do. I, I absolutely Phew. agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that what's problematic though um, is when you're new when you're starting to communicate or or building your business and kind of finding your voice let's say in the first you know 3 years um it's easy to lose sight of that quote unquote best mate that you're trying to talk to mm-hmm. and um it, it's easy to lose sight of that and focus instead on a few of the negative nellies you may have heard from along the way right like the guy who says oh you're too salesy um when all you're trying to do is move a product like that's like what you do you're a business mm-hmm. you're of course yeah, you're yeah. going to sell sometimes yeah. but you hear these <laughs> negative things along the way and those guys can get into your head more than your prospective oh, customer yeah. does so i think that's a big one is who to push out and who to let in so let in like you say that person that that would most likely want to get this from you and end up happy with it happy enough hopefully to talk about you or come back and say nice things to you so you feel good before you go to bed at night mm. um, and push out the bad guys i have in my head people who have said along the way things that have kept me back and they didn't mean any harm by it they just thought that they were helping like coach me (laughs) in growing my business and it it made me edit myself so I felt like I don't know it 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 didn't work for me to follow those negative 
that negative feedback and I'd much rather fo- focus on the positive, right? But yes, focus on the person um, who's most likely to buy from you and be really, really happy with what they purchased from you. Getting to know that person is another question entirely. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And and I, I would imagine getting to know them really, um, getting to know their problems that you can solve, kind mm-hmm. of what, what's bugging them. Yep. Get all of it, right? What they love what like they crazy love, who they love, the kinds of places that they spend their free time, particularly online, if you're trying to um, communicate with them online, not because you're planning on advertising in those spaces, but because it can help to know that your audience spends a lot of time on things like crack.com or other, you know, these kind of jokester sites and things like Mm -hmm. that, if that's the case, rather than assuming that you know, making assumptions about people find out where they go. And you can find out a lot of a lot of times, just by asking them, which is like, scary, in some cases. But then once you get that information, you're like, how did I ever try to live without this and grow my business without this more intimate knowledge of exactly whom I'm speaking with. Yeah, yeah, totally. You you talk about um, swiping the copyright from your prospects mouths. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> that's where, so when we say that you should write a first draft, okay, that's, that's fine. I think then though, be sure to edit in that voice of customer, which is quote unquote voice of customer data, right? The things that people are saying about you, um, to you or out in the world, out and out and out and about. Yeah. Yeah. We say about, but you say about. It was about, I said it right. Okay. Okay. You go with that. I'll reply it later. <laughs> Hell. I know Canadians aren't supposed to say about or one other one because everyone's like, really? Oh, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> really Canadian. Gotcha. But anyway. So swiping copy from the prospect's mouth, that's, uh, yeah. that, is that just kind of listening in and, and listening to how they talk and, and what they talk about when they're talking about your business or your industry or the brands that you sell? Well, it's one part, yeah, eavesdropping on them, right? If you know where they hang out, go pay attention to the way they talk there. Yep. Um, But it's also when you get things like testimonials, let's say you get a natural language testimonial, someone wrote and said, oh, this is awesome. Or you saw they posted it on Twitter about something really cool that that your service did. Um, That's the kind of the language that they're using there. Twitter is often hard because there's so few characters to Mm -hmm. work with. But it's a really natural place for like testimonial ish stuff to occur or to be communicated. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's like other testimonials that are just sent into you, right? Like, oh, I loved your book or whatever it might be. Um, And the natural Mm -hmm. language that's usually hidden inside there, these interesting things. So we did a test actually recently. Um, Well, this was a couple months ago where we were trying to determine really the value proposition for this company. Um, we couldn't get our heads around it entirely. They couldn't because they were so they were too close to it, right? Which is often a problem for small businesses because you're in it. You yeah, think yeah, yeah. that would be a really good part, but sometimes it just like buries you. It's just too much to see through. Um, so we were all trying to figure out what the value proposition was for this company and then to try to use it as a headline on the homepage, which is what we often recommend to copy hackers that you do. So we came up with all these things on our own, right? Oh, here's one thing we think is unique and how it is here's another thing, here's another thing. And none of them were performing well in this A, B, C, D test. It was was getting into a pretty big test of these headlines. And so we were like, oh, that sucks. So we went and looked through their site and I stumbled across this testimonial they had on some random page where um, the person had said, um, your solution, whatever, the the company name, I I can't actually remember it because my memory is terrible for names. But um, they said it saves us 99% of uh, paper every month or something on paperwork every month. And it was the language 99% uh, on your paperwork or something like that. It was that exact phrase that we pulled right. directly from a testimonial. It was already sitting there on their website. It just needed to be elevated. We tested that as the headline and it was the results were practically instant because the conversions were flying in on that one compared to yeah, love it. other terrible ones. So yeah, that's yeah. a right an example of going out, looking at what you already have heard from customers and just identifying like the gold in there and using that as your message. You don't even have to put it in quotes, right? Just take out the good stuff and call that headline. So, so what you say? Great copy should should it mirror 
how your customers think and feel about your business? It should mirror it and it should also just plain state it, mm. right? Just just take exactly what they said and put it over here. Mm. <laughs> take take the you know when you, this is another really good trick. It it's it's good I think when you start using it and practicing it and it's a little hard from what I understand the first time. So if anybody decides to do this, do it more than once and it'll start making more sense. But the idea is that you head on over to Amazon. So you're trying to find messages. Maybe you don't have customers yet or you're scared to reach out to get testimonials or to do interviews. Uh, you yep. sent out surveys and they're not coming back with anything that's really useful. Their long answers are like really scripted or short or not that helpful. So you can't get to that you know voice of customer data that we're looking for. You're not finding anything. So you don't always have to go look at your customers. You can look at the type of people who might be your customers and see what they're saying and swipe messages from them. So this is the exercise is to go, let's say that your topic is, I did this actually um, with really great success for a rehab um, in Florida. They were trying to optimize their site and, and I was helping them with that. I went to Amazon and looked up books on um alcoholism, on living with an alcoholic, on overcoming drug addiction. And it wasn't the books I was worried about so much as the language that was used in the book reviews. Amazon is, as anybody who's bought a book there knows, just completely packed with a lot of really detailed, wonderful book reviews. Mm. And in those reviews, there are so many um unscripted but easy to understand messages that people are sharing about what matters to them what hurts them what's you know really interesting to them what delights them what they're still curious about and haven't gotten an answer to yet all sorts of things that are like amazing for trying to write copy so you don't have to think it up you're going to go look at amazon book reviews and they're going to tell you like what is going on what their needs are what their wants are what's still missing for them that someone else needs to fill for them so i went and did this exercise where i went through reviews and looked for essentially just things that stood out when it comes down to it and there was this one phrase um this gentleman had written um, a book review for something about um alcoholism and his line that he said in there uh, was if you think you need rehab you do and um, it's pretty straightforward language right someone might say that walking you know talking to somebody oh well if you think you need rehab you probably do um, and that was the phrase and we pulled it out and tested that as a homepage headline and they internally everybody was voting against this because this tone was completely different from what you're used to seeing in rehab spaces, right? Where it's always very quite floral and don't worry and hear like really long stories and things like that too. And this was really straight into the point and it performed like crazy. I think they got 400% more leads with this headline than before. And for a rehab center, something like that. If anybody's heard this, me tell the story before, yeah. It might have been 383 or something like that. <laughs> but there was a large, a huge percentage increase of um, leads that they got. And of course, every lead for them is worth $25,000 at minimum yeah, to yeah. fill a bed. So it all really adds up. And all you had to do was go out and look. Joey, that you don't mind if I call you. You don't mind if I call you Joey because uh, that, that is uh, that is the tip of the day. I need a little anthem to play. Um, <laughs> that's gold. I love that stuff because that just makes sense. I mean, there is so much pre-existing content yes. and knowledge and advice and and copy sitting there. Yeah. And and yeah, I've I've ne never thought of going to Amazon and looking for it. Um, you know, I'm thinking as you're speaking about that, I get a lot of listener emails. I get a lot of reviews on iTunes and I read mm. them because it makes it pumps me up and can allows me to continue to do what I do. But now I'm going to look at them in a completely different light and look at the language that they're using and what they're focusing on and include that in future emails. Look out listeners. <laughs> <laughs> now they're going to be really careful when they send you an email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. They're going to go, okay, I got an email from Tim and then they're going to head over to Amazon and look up marketing <laughs> books for small business and see which review I've copied. Uh, no, that's great. That's gold, Joe. Thank you. Um, good, did you know, good. Do you know Joey? I called you Joey before. That's a baby kangaroo. 
Yeah, I know. Yeah? My dad used to call me that. Cool. I, um, now, uh, we've got th- – that's three tips. I like to work in odd numbers. I want to get a couple more. But so far, we've got understand your audience, swipe copy straight from your customer's mouth, head over to Amazon and look at the reviews and see what people are saying in regards to books related to your industry. I've heard you talk – I've done a little bit of investigating. Some would call it stalking, but um, – <laughs> That, that would be wrong. But you talk about three levels of calls to three levels of, of a call to action to mm. increase conversions. Now, one thing I know for sure is that many of us small business owners don't spend enough time thinking, what do we want people to do having read my copy? And that would be a call to action. So tell us about these three levels. Oh, so the three levels. So the ones I talk about in book four. Mm-hmm. Uh, so are we talking about like primary, secondary? Oh, are we talking ne- about like as you're moving through an experience? Hang on. Just let me get the geek alert siren sound effect, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let, let's let's actually keep that simple because let's talk call to action. You know, don't, don't worry about the three levels. Let's talk call to action um, and, and the importance of it yeah. and how one should approach it in their writing. Okay. That's awesome. I mean, we've just done this really, we're actually still finishing it. It's this mega experiment on buttons um, across like 20 plus startup small business websites um, where we were testing just, just buttons, just calls to action to see, you know, what's really working. And if we can, you know, triangulate some data across a bunch of different tests to see if we can actually make conclusions. Right. Um, so we're learning some things definitely. Um, in addition to the things that we already believed to be true. Um, and, and one of those is moving. Um, I don't want to say I've been saying this, but I'm not I'm not comfortable with the phrase yet, but I'm going to say it. But it's not it's not final. It's just an idea that we're working with. Let's workshop it. Okay, it's really about um, calls. I'm going to say I'm going to say calls to value rather than calls to action. So when we're talking about calls to action, we tend to make that more about the action, (laughs) which is good, which is good, right? It's good. They need to have that action word in there to know, Mm -hmm. to take action. I think that's good. Um, But we often leave out the critical stuff that's going to get them to take that action, like reminders of the outcome that they're about to see or about to get when they actually sign up to, to work with you or to use your solution. Okay. So what, you, what you're what identifying is I would call them little taps on the shoulder along the way to say, hey, by the way, just check out the value that you're going to get by buying from me. Yeah. And I mean, we've called those click triggers in the copy hackers in book four, we refer to them like the little messages you put around a button as like a click trigger. It's the thing that's going to trigger them to click. So it's yeah, a click yeah, trigger, yeah. right? Gotcha. Little last minute things that should push them over that that wall that's keeping them away. Yep. But the value part seems to be, to me, more built into the button copy itself. So the copy that's on the button, instead of saying, you know, donate now it's talking more about the value associated with like what are how are you going to feel when you donate yeah i don't want to donate now right which is a friction word and we talk about friction words quite a bit on our blog um i don't want to donate now that's not my goal as a human being is to donate now that's my task at the moment but it's not my goal i don't mm. i don't feel about donating that's that's work so donates the action you're looking for the be- you're looking for the outcome or the benefit of donating yeah yeah and so i've called it value because if i just said benefit i think that i would limit myself to just benefits and i'm thinking about it when it's actually like this just all good things it's called to goodness mm. <laughs> it's a call to mm. amazing wonderful feelings yep. um but that's yeah no, I get that. I mean, at the end of the day, we were writing copy to do something. We want people to to do something or feel something. And uh, I get those calls to value, uh, which obviously then leads to a call to action, which is call me, visit me, register here, buy this, whatever it's going to be. But um, in order to get someone there, there's got to be a little bit of um, – a little bit of uh, of calls to value along the way. So I get that. Not sure calls to value is the right phrase. It's not, it feels a bit kind of clunky. It's, like, it's something closer, right? It's it's a movement 
mentally as I'm thinking of writing a button, which we tend to write extremely quickly, right? We mm. just throw down, oh, well, submit, which is why the submit button is yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so huge, right? Even if anybody had ever thought about that, they wouldn't have put that in. Um, nobody wants to submit. Well, I guess a certain group of like 50 shades of gray people want Correct. to submit or something like that. But but in this case, not so much. So um, yeah, it's just, it is not it's not cost value, but it's something. So I challenge all of your listeners to find out what that something is. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting discussion because what you've highlighted here, um, listeners, we got listeners who are, you know, like dentists and, and accountants and, you know, bricks and mortar small businesses. And some of them, you know, we're talking about an online internet marketing kind of play here, which is, you know, the importance of the button. And and some of them will be going, why are they talking about the button? And, you know, what about all the other kind of copy things? But I think the, the learning here, guys, is the fact that um, these little things, the little, you've all got a website and all those websites have got buttons, whether they be navigation buttons or buttons to register for something or to make an inquiry. These little things are so important. You know, mm. in fact, yeah. it's it's the pointy end. You know, if you look at copy as going, well, you start off broad and you have this kind of conversation that settles people in to a mm-hmm. journey to inquiry or buying something, then the pointy end is the call to action. And um, yeah. so. Absolutely. And, and further to that, when we're thinking of that like inverted pyramid, um, I would say that you should to write a page really well to move people closer to that pointy end, I would start with pointy end, start with the call to action, start with the thing that you want them to mm-hmm. do, and then build out around that. And you're constantly at answering questions. Is this enough to get them to, to do it, to get closer to my button? And then once I'm on the button to click it, right? If you start with your button, mm. um, right, it is a, it's a trick of the trade but that's a much easier way to figure out what copy needs to be on the page and what doesn't, what messages need to be there and what don't. If you're trying to get someone to sign up to, you know, get a free consult with you or, or learn about teeth whitening, if you're a dentist, Mm -hmm. um, then knowing what that call to action is, is and working out from there rather than starting at a headline and trying to work down to your call to action. Um, you can see that it, it, Frankly, it gets a lot easier when you start with the button and work out. Yeah, good advice, Joe. Hey, one la- I'm going to put you on the spot here. you got 30 seconds oh. to give me oh. because I just like to round it off. You know, it's the anal retentiveness in me that needs <laughs> five tips and not four. Four's just not working for me. So um, five last-minute kind of little quick, quick and dirty copywriting tip for the small business owner. In 30 seconds? Yeah, 20 now. Wow. Okay. 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 okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I like the challenge, but I'm stressed about it. Okay. Um, for any testimonial, use an introductory header bit to reinforce what the testimony is going to say. Um, okay. 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 Uh, yeah. Moving out. Um, make sure your attention, your headline grabs people's attention. It's not there to sell. Mm. It's there to grab attention. That doesn't mean it has to have like explosions in it. But it has to grab attention, not sell, move people down to the next line. That's tip number three. Every line should lead people down to the next line. Tip number four, oh. really short, only necessary form fields. Am I out of time? You are so out of time. But that <laughs> that second last one, I didn't get the last one, but the second last one about every line should lead someone onto the next line, that, that one excites me. I, I do like that. And it's a... Um, that's not easy to do, but if you think about someone gets to the end of a sentence, that's a point where you go, do I keep reading or don't? So uh, yeah, I love that. Hey, Joanne Weeb from Copy Hackers, thanks so much for being uh, a contributing part to the Small Business Big Marketing Tribe. It's been great. It's been fun. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening, everyone. Absolutely. And, and, and guys, um, I will put some links in the show notes, but head over to copyhackers.com and um, you've there is so much gold there, so many beautiful little freebies and things that you can buy to actually improve your copywriting. So, so on, head over there. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Timbo. Well, there you go, team. Joanna Weeb from copyhackers.com. <laughs> 
Is your pad, your journal just completely chockers of copywriting tips? I hope so. Shortly, I'm going to share my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Joanna. Plus, I award a listener with some prizes for sharing with us a marketing idea they learnt and implemented from this show. But first, here's a great business tip from past guest and Amex card member, Chris Gray. This show is made possible thanks to American Express Business Explorer credit card, a card that lets your business expenses reward you. I asked Amex member Chris Gray, CEO of property buying business Your Empire, how he benefits from using his Amex. I use Amex for the whole of my business. Literally every single thing I pay in my business, even down to effectively my staff or my contractors and my rent at home, everything goes on the Amex card. Because with Amex, you get the most points for your dollar spent. And I convert those points into frequent flyer rewards points. I fly 10 or 15 times a year, only business and first class, including those beautiful A380 suites you get on Singapore Airlines where you get your own bedroom. And I fly for free. I don't pay for a single flight. But it's not all upside. Or is it? So I've got a, I've still got a million points because I spend so much money in my business. I've then got to pre-plan 10 trips for next year of where do I want to go? I need to find excuses to go to different countries. <laughs> this is a massive first world problem, Chris. It is, but I'm willing to put up with it. So there's, there's very few people that can, uh, can force themselves through the pain barrier, but I'm willing to do it. I've trained myself. <laughs> New American Express card members who apply and spend $3,000 in the first three months from the card approval date receive a bonus 100,000 membership rewards points. Ah, you got to love it when your business expenses reward you. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Offer ends November 30, 2017. Terms and conditions apply. Ha! I always wanted to do that. All righty. My top three attention grabbers from that chat with Joanna Weeb from copyhackers.com. Thanks to the very, very good folk at American Express. Attention grabber number one, write your first draft and then go and get a writer to polish it. I like that. I really like that. I mean, if you write your first draft, at least it gives that writer a sense of what you're trying to communicate and how you write and what your tone of voice is, but then get the professional to turn it into copy that converts and and compare the difference. You will be absolutely amazed. Go to a website like an Upwork uh, if you don't know if you don't have a local copywriter uh, of your own. Maybe you've got a colleague who knows a copywriter. Attention grabber number two. I love the idea of reading and pulling apart reviews of books relevant to your industry on book sites like you know Amazon or Booktopia, whatever website you use to buy your books. But Amazon's a great one because it's got just so many reviews on it. And then studying the language being used in those reviews. What the reviewer loved, what they didn't love, what was missing. You will learn so much by that simple, simple exercise. And attention grabber number three, I love how Joanna reinforces what I've always said about finding and honouring your voice in all of your marketing. Be yourself and avoid being someone you're not. And boy, oh boy, does it take the pressure off and make your marketing messages so much more personal, so much more on brand. That's what grabbed my attention, team. You will find all the links and resources mentioned in that chat with Joanna over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 419. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, indeedly, doodly, it is that time of the episode that I love. Time to give away some prizes, time to hear from a motivated listener who has actioned something they've learned from this show. And that's what the Monster Prize Draw is all about. All I ask is that you email me, tim at timreid.com.au, share something you've learned from this show and implemented and what impact it's had on your business. If I read it out, you get some prizes kindly donated by myself and a past guest, and you go into the running to win a hot lap in a Porsche uh, with Steve Richards. 
legend racing car driver and past guest. That's valued at two and a half grand. And the winner will be the letter of the year that I'll announce later in the year. Pretty simple, right? Okay, who is today's winner? Today's winner is, insert drum roll. It is Nick Reed from reedstockfeeds.com.au. And I promise no relation, despite the fact that his spelling is exactly the same. Reed Stock Feeds provide uh, food for chooks, cows, pigs, and sheep. Now, this is what Nick has implemented in his business. He says, hey, Timbo, the biggest benefit thus far... You don't see the word thus a lot these days. Quite like it. Very oldie worldy, but nice work there, Nick. The biggest benefit thus far has been the discovery of Design Crowd. While it requires an investment of time to provide the brief and a constant stream of feedback to the designers who are putting in their designs, the results are vastly superior to using an in house team of designers or designers from bag companies. What Nick's getting designed are the bags in which the feed goes into, and they're really, really good. I mean, you know, it would be easy enough to go, oh, it's just chook feed or cow feed. We don't need to put any design into those bags, but clearly he has. I've checked them out on his website, and they are absolutely a point of difference. Um, He goes on to say, have used a design crowd extensively in redesigning our bag range for statewide distribution, now stocking in over 100 Victorian store partners and still growing store partners and sales. Great. So he's implementing the partnership strategy. Love that. Uh, he, He finishes by saying, read this out on a future episode, Timbo, and I'll seed you, in quotes, boom, boom, you a free bag of eggs for sure. It's the best chook feed going around. Nick, I really appreciate that, mate, but I'll, I'll decline the offer. Um, I actually, there are people with chooks uh, behind us, uh, despite the fact that we live in suburbia. Uh, I can hear them right now. However, you can keep your bag of eggs for sure, but I really appreciate that. Um, love the fact that you're using and benefiting from Design Crowd. Anyone who's listening, if you're not, Design Crowd um, along, and there's a number of other ones out there, but Design Crowd, um, basically it's a crowdsourcing website where lots of designers submit finished solutions, graphic design solutions for your design brief. And then you feed back to them, you shortlist them, you pick the winner and you transfer the funds. And the funds that you're transferring are often so much cheaper than you might be paying elsewhere. And it's just a fantastic way to do it. They are a sponsor of this show. This this email was not set up. Uh, designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo. You get a hundred bucks off your brief if you use that. Uh, and I'd love to know if you do. Um, one other point on uh, Nick's website. I went and checked it out. Um, this is not part of his email, but he's got a fantastic team page. You click on it and he introduces every single member of the Reed Stock Feeds team. And I clicked on Nick, saw a photo, a mug shot of his, his mug. He's got a great head for podcasting as Nick, as do I. Um, and he answers just some fun questions about himself. And you get to know him at a more personal level. One of the questions was, are you a cat or a dog person? And Nick's response is, tough call, but dog by a whisker. Boom, boom. Too hard to go jogging with a cat he says. <laughs> I like that. Hey, Nick, I love your sense of humour. I love the fact that you've used Design Crowd. I love the fact that you, you are designing your feed bags for the various animals that you are feeding. Good on you. You, you have won two Amex lounge passes that'll get you into the Amex International Lounge at the Melbourne or Sydney airport. That's valued at 66 bucks. You get a backlink on the Small Business Big Marketing website. That's valued at priceless uh, six pack of Mr. Lee's noodles valued at 30 puck, 30 bucks and an eight pack of crisps from the good crisp company valued at 30 bucks all of which are past guests of the show anyone else if you'd like to enter the monster prize draw you you got a good chance of winning as I said the other week letters are drying up email me Tim at Tim Reed reid.com.au <laughs> Now, if you liked the highly practical nature of today's show, and I know many of you do, then you'll love a couple of other episodes I've done just like this one. There's the one I did where I personally answered all your podcasting questions, and there's another one in which past guest Melissa Maker interviewed me about how to become proficient in public speaking and how I've made an entire business from it. You'll find both those episodes plus hundreds more 
over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com or you can subscribe free on your favourite podcast app, which means you'll never miss another episode. Hey, I'd really love to hear from you. Maybe you've got some feedback about the show. Maybe you want to pump my tyres. Maybe you want to tell me that, you know, pull your finger out, Timbo. You know, show's crook. <laughs> Don't do that. No, I've got a tough skin. I love constructive feedback. Well, anyway, you can go over to the contact button over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and, um, and hit me up there. Um, you can't buy my book at the moment. Um, it's out, I've just I've just sold the last copy. Three thousand copies done. The boomerang effect. But I will get it uh, reprinted and let you know when it's back for sale. Big thanks to American Express for exclusively sponsoring this episode. If you love the idea of your business expenses rewarding you, then search Amex Business. I've had a few listeners ask which card is best. Great question, and it does depend on your circumstances. But a good place to start would be with the Business Explorer card. Again, Google. Amex Amex business to find out more. If you love the show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone and downloading it from for them. Or if you've got an email database of small business owners, maybe just send out a little note and a link to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and say, get on board. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reid. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.